Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy Safran and this is Kitco News. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe for the latest market news. Well, on the show today, March's producer price index, otherwise known as the PPI, increased by only 0.2%, suggesting a slower inflation growth at the wholesale level, slightly soothing some investor concerns. But yet, the March 2024 CPI report has captured the market's attention because it revealed a 3.5% year-over-year increase, indicating that inflationary pressures are not subsiding quite as quick as hoped. Now, with bond traders eyeing a potential 5% surge in 10-year U.S. Treasury yields, the market is pricing in fewer cuts here, possibly taking a June uh, rate cut off the table and trying to understand the Fed's next move. Now, to help us break this down, we have Michelle, or otherwise known as Mish Schneider, Chief Strategist at MarketCage.com, joining us. Now, Mish, you've been pretty spot on about market predictions. Uh, thanks for coming on to Kitco News. Thank you, Jeremy, for having me on. It's such a pleasure to be here. Of course. Now, I want to start here by talking about the March CPI number. Obviously, it came in at 3.5% year over year, slightly above expectations. Uh, talk to me about the economic data here. Is anything surprising you? Well, what's so interesting is that people really want to put everything into a categorical box. Inflation's going up, inflation's going down. And what we saw in these numbers yesterday with CPI and today with PPI is how nuanced they are. And that's kind of where we're at. So, for example, you had the core goods almost looking deflationary yesterday, but you look at something like auto insurance was up 23%. And that's kind of what we're having. We're having pockets of areas that are still very sticky in terms of inflation, others that are more in disinflation or deflation. And overall, we have the uh, Fed basically confused as to what to do and where, which direction they want to go in from here. And that makes a lot of sense. But I would say from the numbers that we're seeing, we're not certainly looking at hyperinflation at this point. So that's the good news. Yeah, interesting. You know, considering the bond market's reaction to the CPI data with expectations for maybe higher to longer interest rates, what's your take on the Fed here? What are they going to be doing? Well, there's again, there's two conversations to have about what the Fed can do. The, I think the biggest one is, are they going to choose possibly goosing inflation a little higher and based on their num right. these recent numbers, feeling that they can? Or the interest payments on the debt, which is obviously everyone knows ginormous at this point, costs a lot at these high interest rates. Will they, by simply reducing 150 basis points, they reduce their interest payments by 33%. Will they go that route? Because if they don't, they're creating a lot of stress in the financial world. So that's, I think, the question. So if I had to take a guess... I would say this sort of st sticking here between four and a half and five and a half percent is somewhat of a normalization. If you look back historically, we have a generation that has been fed on ZERP and that not realistic and obviously not very sustainable. So if we can stay here and work out the economy where we get that no landing scenario and things stay status quo, the Fed may actually go ahead and lower a little bit, but I don't think unless something explosive happens with a war, they're going to raise at this point either. Yeah, it's uh, it's been fascinating to watch. I mean, talk a little bit about this debt servicing level. You mentioned 33%. How much is the Fed in a tight spot here? Obviously, they're nonpartisan. We have an election coming up. They need to service that debt. Are they stuck? Is this a double-edged sword? This is definitely between a rock and a hard place, no doubt. Yeah. And you mentioned that they're nonpolitical, but yesterday, and this was very unusual. I've not seen President Biden make any comments, not too much about the markets. I mean, you would think that he would be touting when he was making all-time highs. But yesterday he came out and said, oh, don't worry. We are going to have a reduction in interest rates sometime this year. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, look at him stepping into the world of the Fed. So who knows? I mean, that to me, if there's any kind of forecasting, tells you which way the Fed is leaning. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they should be nonpartisan. Obviously, they shouldn't be political in that stance. Uh, what a blow to Fed Chair Jerome Powell on that topic. I mean, you know, the president coming out and saying, we're not sure what's going to happen, but expect it this year. <laughs> well, Powell, I have to say, love him or hate him, he's had a relatively cool head. And you can just imagine how much pressure he gets, not just from other Fed members. I mean, right now, the big monster of the Fed has been Kashkari, 
who was historically the most dovish of the Fed members now mm -hmm. becoming the big hawk, he has done a really good job, Powell, in just keeping with the numbers and basically having an incredible amount of patience in the face of all of the various statistics that have come out over the last couple of years. Yeah, and interesting data too. I was reading an article this morning that basically said the COVID reset has been such an interesting time for our economy that the economic data doesn't really make sense. It was even more substantial than 2008. Uh, are we looking at the data the right way here? Well, I know you wanted to talk about gold, so I'm going to jump in with gold because right. here is yeah. a perfect example, Jeremy, of what you're really saying is in 2022, as the interest rates were going up and up and up at this incredible rate of speed, gold was going up and the accumulation by central banks was starting to increase to numbers not seen possibly ever. Then in 2023, even though rates sort of peaked out, when you had this tremendous explosion in technology stocks and large cap stocks, gold was still going up and banks were accumulating it. And when I say going up, I don't mean we haven't had our corrections, but the general right. direction of central bank accumulation going up. Now in 2024, with the market making new all-time highs and the rates still where they've been, the dollar, I wouldn't exactly say super strong, but certainly not weak, kind of sideways for a long period of time, the accumulation of banks continues to go up. So you have to say why, right? right. And so going back to your question about COVID, that, that's starting a whole new world, a whole new paradigm, certainly is the case. And what gold, I think, is reflecting is that even though the market's gone up for a slew of reasons that we could talk about, and it's been very pocketed in terms of what areas have gone up, gold is telling you that there is a lot of fracture potential under the surface. And I think that's one of the big reasons why, to your point, we're not really necessarily having the same world we used to have before COVID. Yeah. I mean, it's very interesting to look. Obviously, central banks continue to buy. Uh, I think it was back in, what, early 2023, you were on Fox Business and you said that gold would double. Now, it hasn't doubled, but it sure has, as you mentioned, been parabolic. I'm curious about your forecast now. Well, the reason why I had gone on the show and said that, and it was about 1,500, so can we get to 3,000? Of course, that's the big question. Right. And we can, we can deal with what would make it go to 3,000. What I saw was exactly what we just talked about, a lot of potential chaos under the surface. I mean, at the time, we had Ukraine and Russia as the major war headline. And even though that's still going on, it's been trumped, obviously, by the Middle East. And it's so headline sensitive right now. Iran is going to send a missile to Israel. Oh, they're going to postpone it. And so, but essentially you've got a lot of nervousness in that the geopolitics have been at least chaotic around the world, but not to a point where they could be, but the fear of it. Number two, you've had tremendous amount of weather issues, which has created a stress on a lot of raw materials. Um, some of them have, of course, have recovered since then, but others keep popping. Cocoa, of course, being the biggest headline that we saw this year. And now coffee has been going up because of drought. Um, you also have, again, this rising debt that has been rising since the beginning of 2023 and before. That's not stopping. And then on top of that, you have a lot of government spending. And it can, that also continues on and on and on. So I think that I made the prediction based on the fact that Regardless of whether you're in the Bitcoin, Bitcoin over gold, it doesn't matter. To me, gold was still the hard asset that people will run to in the uncertainty. And clearly, we're seeing the evidence, as we just mentioned, by the central bank buying. Yeah. Yeah. And as you look at it now, I mean, near your 3,000 predicament, I mean, we're sitting at 2350 around there. Uh, what's your short term forecast? Where do you see this going in the current climate? Well, I do think it can go up. To, I still maintain it can go up to 3,000, may even su supersede that, but quickly. Right. You know, as a, as a former floor trader in commodities, and certainly people really have a textbook case this year with cocoa, you can see what happens with commodities. 
they can get extremely emotional. And when they get emotional, and when I say they, I mean people who are buying commodities get emotional, it can go parabolic, right? And so we don't know. 3,000 is just a target that I've mentioned, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the target. Could stop at 2,800, could go to 3,200. The point is, is that the factors that have gotten gold here without hyperinflation, can you just imagine now, and this is kind of what I'm tr thinking about, if the Fed starts to cut, that will certainly right. goose inflation more. If the war really escalates into what some people fear as a World War III type of scenario, that would also make oil go nuts, which right now it's high, but it's not crazy high, mm -hmm. trading between 84 and $88 a barrel if you're looking at WTI. So these are the things, or the debt spirals, or we have some kind of a credit event that so many people are looking at. If you look at the commercial banks, they're still not doing very well relative to the big banks, and we've got those earnings coming up soon. So any of these things can really goose gold up even higher, and even though central banks are buying, I think we still have a lot of retail investors who have been aside in it and haven't even begun to get into it if things really presented as we just laid out. Right. And what do you think the timing is here, Mish? I mean, is this before 2020? Is this just until the end of the year? I mean, we're seeing all of this data come out. There's a little bit of talk about two cuts this year. Are we going to see $3,000 gold in 2024? I Well, I, I don't want to rule it out, but my right. guess is, I mean, if you just look at how the cycle of commodities are, right? So 2021 was really when we started to see the inflation go nuts up at that eight, nine percent. And of course, we're down to uh, three and a half percent. Let's use the CPI mm -hmm. numbers. And I think I had sent you that overlay chart of the 70s and now. And just like uh, interest rates had peaked in 1975, they peaked in 2022, they troughed in 1977, they've troughed in, in, in 2024 in terms of the CPI numbers. Now we're starting to move up. So if we follow along that graph, it wasn't until 1979 that things really got crazy. So if we know that the time has sped up a little bit, but kind of keeping that line, I wouldn't be surprised to see 2025, even 2026, where we start to see the peak in gold potentially. Interesting. Okay, so it'll continue to go. I mean, you know, it's it's really wild to see because as economic data comes out, sometimes you'd think gold would have maybe a sell-off or a pullback and go the other direction, but it really hasn't. It's been very resilient. So if the data improves and inflation pressures subside, could we witness a significant pullback or is this the new reality here, all-time highs? Well, the new reality for as long as it's the reality. I mean, one thing yeah. you've learned through the years is nothing lasts forever. Yeah. Um, well, you, you mentioned if inflation subsides um, and the economy continues to improve, it, 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 that, that's the thing is what would really make inflation subside? We know that we can't get down to that 2% target. People mm -hmm. have suggested that perhaps the Fed will raise the, the, the inflation target to 3%. So far, Powell has made no indication of that. So mm -hmm. inflation is really now just one part of it. It's enough to keep it sticking, keep gold here. But I don't see inflation subsiding anytime soon because of all the factors that we just mentioned. Um, and also because we do have other stresses onto raw materials right now, particularly technology. Anything that is being used with supercomputers, whether it's AI or in battery making or infrastructure for EVs. All of this requires raw materials as well. So I just don't know at what point are we going to get to a world, and it will happen eventually, where these costs start to come down, normalize to a point where we can hit more 2%, and then you know, we're back to like where we were before. I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. So, Yeah, and I don't think we're going to get to that 2% level as the Fed has been trying to get to too. Uh, let's look at historical economic patterns. Uh, like obviously the 1970s, we had that inflationary period back then. Are we back there? Well, again, there's, you know, they say history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. <laughs> so I don't think we're going to see an actual repetition of what we saw in 1979. But we do know that part of the reason why 79 happened is we came out of a period of a war 
the Vietnamese mm -hmm. War, which cost a lot of money. And then there were reparations to that, which also cost a lot of money. From a political standpoint, we came out of Nixon having to resign and Jimmy Carter becoming president. Um, we had a lot of just social unrest within this country in and of itself. The 70s were very tumultuous. So we have some similarities now particularly with an election year coming up, which, you know, who knows what's going to happen there yeah. in terms of who wins, what's there, if there's contention, if one candidate doesn't win and the other one does, you know, we don't know. But what we do know in the, similar, in the dissimilarities is we don't have the price of goods nearly at the levels that we had in terms of the grains and a lot of the soft commodities. Back in 1979, and I love to talk about sugar, in 1979, sugar prices, they had peaked in 76 at 65 or 66 cents a, a, a pound. And then they went all the way down with that trough that I'm talking about in CPI that dropped in 77. 79, sugar was really the lead indicator in terms of getting into hyperinflation. Mm. And it went up to about 45 cents when gold was going up to 850 and silver was going up to 40. And so the reason why I like to look at sugar is because sugar is a food staple that's in practically everything, whether it's a, a demon child of, for people's diets, it still exists everywhere. And people will tend to hoard in so bad times sugary foods and sugar in and of itself. It, it, it happened actually last year. There were fights so in certain countries over sugar when it was at a real shortage. And that's not happening right now. Actually, the supply of sugar has come back a little bit uh, after India had basically stopped exporting. They've had a better crop. So to me, what that tells me is this time looks like similar, but it's not the same. I'm not expecting a spike to 12, 15 percent of inflation, but it doesn't have to happen that way to still create the havoc we're talking about to send the precious metals soaring. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, talking about precious metals, let's go specifically in there. You know, we just talked about rising debt levels. Of course, we got some increased spending in some areas and then the geopolitical uncertainties. How do investors navigate these choppy waters here, especially in the precious metals and bond market? I mean, you got 14 years as a commodities uh, trader. Uh, you've seen some things. I've seen some things, yes. Well, right now, I think... Um, one thing you learn as a commodities trader is go with the momentum, right? So it, in the last year, we've had different places to go in the momentum outside of the precious metals, and they really didn't have much momentum. Gold really didn't get kick into gear until it took out 2100, and it's yeah. gone up very quickly to the 23, I think, what, it peaked out around 2380 or something. So um, <clears throat> these shallow pullbacks are buy opportunities, I think. Um, however, we're not panicking just yet because certain indications that we've learned in commodities markets is like silver will outperform gold during high inflationary times. Gold miners will lead gold during high inflationary times. We've seen gold miners come up. We've seen silver come up, but not to the point where it's in any kind of an outperformance to gold. So that's why I say keep your eyes on that, because what we're saying is this is not necessarily a hyperinflation scenario. This is more of a chaotic underpinning warning scenario of what could go wrong, in which case at that point you'll be able to pile into silver if you really start seeing in any sense that ratio between gold and silver, silver outperforming. And miners will also go up as, as, as a result too. I mean, and one thing I wanna say about, think about the price of silver, even at $27, $28 an ounce. In 1980, it was at $40, the Dow was a thousand, right. okay? Here we are in 2024. So silver is almost a little more than half of, of where it was back then, and the Dow is at 38,000. I mean, so, you know, you've got uh, the, the, the equities have just gone up so much faster than the actual metals. So that tells you in and of itself, it's something to keep an eye on. And if it starts to go up, you won't be missing the boat. You can definitely jump into silver if you start to see that volatility come into play. Little silver tip. I love it. Michelle or me, Schneider, a chief strategist at marketgage.com. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on and breaking this down for us. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thanks, Mish. We'll see you soon. And I'm Jeremy Sapper for Kitco News. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel, like the video, tell your friends. I mean, hey, you can even comment. I do read them.
Have a great day and we'll see you next time.